ultimately. Um, but then have Lauren Viet Allen, who's here, and I, I co-directed this with my friend Pilar, who won't be able to make it until later. Um, but having Lauren's visual style really connect with like, we kind of want it to feel like this, or like, you know, Aureli has like sort of like a surrealistic view of the world and like the way she explains things and is like very into her 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 spirituality and um you know the culture of bruja and so we like infuse that through through lauren's artistic vision um it was a really great collaboration among strong women really oh fantastic and, and uh that will be a, a great way to uh bring uh lauren into uh, our conversation um uh, Lauren Viet Allen is a photographer and creative director. Uh, she's Mexican American, a Mexican American photographer, uh, and uh, based in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, her creative collaborations focus on food and travel as a means of gaining a larger understanding of cultural identities and enriching her community. She documents culinary traditions, food, people, and the crossroads uh, where they collide to create compelling editorial and commercial photography. She's uh, the 2019 Visco Voices creator, and her project Grito documents the impact of ballet folklorico as it empowers immigrant youth, preserves Mexican heritage, and educates local communities in rural North Carolina. Lauren, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you here in conversations. And we are now getting into ex the exploration of, okay, guys, you are working in liminal spaces. Yes, where you work, you are interested, or your interest is directed to uh, community constructions or cultural constructions with the community, community journalism, uh, and uh, uh, heritage in what we consider this extended border space, the space in which many of the immigrants uh, in, in this region of, of, of the United States uh, experience, right? They, in this in-betweenness, right? Not here, not there, by cultural practices like cooking, uh, our memories take us back, right? Or give us some solace or uh, affirm our presence or affirm our own identities. Then uh, I, I want you to speak a little bit about your work and uh, why are you doing this and how do you uh, uh, feel this uh, connection between one place and the other or in the creation of a new space, uh, uh, this in this in-betweenness. In and thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Miguel, can everybody hear me okay? Perfect. Just making sure I had a few te technical difficulties when we started. Um, so I grew up as um, an Air Force kid and traveled the world growing up um, with my family and my roots in northern Mexico and south Texas and always traveling back there. there I always had some sort of connection to this space, um, but always, as you mentioned, kind of had this in-betweenness and lived in the liminal. And so by finding ways to document my heritage, other heritage, and um, you know, our world and our roots visually, either through photography, I also have a background in documentary filmmaking. Um, I always found a way to connect visually back to my heritage and dive a little deeper into this world that I'm born from and live from. Um, even though I may not have had a, you know, active time living there. Sorry, give me just one second. Oh, you have a kid. We are I do. people too, don't worry. I do, he just woke up from a nap and is a little grumpy. Um, but yeah, so I I started working with Victoria, um, oh gosh, probably in 2017, 2018. And we started working together on finding interesting and um, visually compelling ways to tie together both um, an art, an artistic eye with documentary work um, to bring awareness to people's consumption of food. Um, so we, at the time, had worked with a lot of chefs who were either immigrants or refugees to the area to tell their story through this, you know, like Instagram friendly food that they were making. 
um, primarily consumed by white people who just love to photograph it for their Instagram. Um, since then, sorry, give me one second. Oh, worry. Oh, we, we have been there. Don't that. Okay. I appreciate it. Um, since then, um, we've worked on a handful of other projects through somewhere south and most recently on making waves. And so I think together thinking of ways where we can document this liminal space that immigrants live in here in the United States, like we, we don't belong in either place yet we're here and our, our roots are from there. So how can we find a way to bring these together visually that can be very conceptual and can be very artistic and can talk to, in the case of making waves, the spirit and the beauty and the history that Aureli keeps within her and how can we bring it out visually and create a narrative that is not only compelling, but is also, you know, educating people on what it's like to be a Latina business owner. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, finding ways to document the liminal and finding ways to, to tell a story in a space um, that we're not actively living is, you know, we're not, we're not living these memories currently. So how do we find a way to bring these memories to life in a way that speaks to our audience? Great. Thank you uh, uh, mm -hmm. for, for those initial words, because we'll come back then. Let's, because we're building it, we'll be in it. I, I want to invite now uh, 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 Jordi Marie, great friend, uh, colleague. Uh, uh, he's one of the, let's say, the cornerstone of the NC Latin American Film Festival for many, many, many years. Um, this is great to have you back. Uh, Jordi is also a professor, uh, a cultural critic, an activist. Um, that it connects the idea of uh, we are trying to bring something that goes beyond the visual or the audiovisual, something that is also embodied somehow. There's a knowledge that is embodied, and we want to bring it through several mediums. Uh, in the case, in the case of of, of Jordi, he's a cultural critic. He's a professor. He is an educator, uh, and he is an intellectual. Uh, Professor Marie teachings and research are focused on social, environmental, and cultural studies with particular attention to contemporary audiovisual production coming from Spain, from Latin America, and from the United States too. Uh, he has several books, uh, uh, among them, uh, Tracing the Borders of Spanish Horror Cinema and Television, Ventanas sobre el Atlántico, and uh, very, uh, among others, and very recently, uh, he had uh, uh, edited a special volume for the journal Humanities, uh, this is uh, early this year, 2022, under the title Socio-Environmental Emergencies and Futuristic Imaginaries in Iber Iberian and Latin American Cinema and Television. Uh, you can go and get uh, uh, the entire copy of this journal. It's, uh, it's uh, an incredible collection, I think 12 uh, uh, articles uh, that that go across uh, the territories and topics, uh, thinking through audiovisual means uh, this emergency of uh, uh, the social and environmental spaces in which we are living. Then Jordi, welcome, it's great to have you back. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about your work in this space of the liminal and the in-betweenness that you found by doing this uh, incredible editorial work. And, and many of the titles that we have been also looking at through uh, the lenses of cinema. Okay, thank you, Miguel, for the introduction and thank you for organizing this. And thank you everyone for being here. It's a pleasure and an honor for me. Um, and uh, I was thinking about the, this concept of borders and border land and border lines and, uh, how it applies to to my work or or what how is it relevant to to the work that I've done over the years and I realized that from the beginning I, I've I've been 
um, exploring and, and moving along those border lines in, in many different ways. And I think the concept of border and the practice and the reality of, of borders is can be seen from many angles and perspectives and can mean many, many things and can be experienced in many ways. And in, in my case, um, perhaps the most obvious thing is that I'm, I'm a Spaniard that has been living in the United States for more than 30 years now, although I've been coming back and forth all the time. So that, I suppose, puts me in that position of, of someone who, who, and also as a, as a scholar who works on Spanish and, and Hispanic and Iberian matters in an American university and, and, and works with American as well as Spanish scholars and students. So in that sense, I've, I, my practice and my experience, professional and, and personal experience is very much a border one. But also in terms of, of the books, you mentioned some, some of the work that I've done. My very first book um, was an exploration of the interactions and interconnections of film and the novel in, in contemporary Spain. So it was a what we could call an intermedial type of study of writing, which we, or I in this case, studied the ways in which the heritage of cinema um, has impacted and influenced the way many contemporary Spanish writers write their novels and also the way in which uh, those novels are read because um, we are dealing with readers that are, and that encompasses pretty much all of us here, I suppose, readers that are uh, spectators at the same time and that have grown up and grown uh, watching films and that experience and, and the skills and the uh, habits of watching films project or, or, or influence the way we read also. Uh, at many levels, not just the obvious levels, but also at, at other levels. So in that sense, this is a, a border type of study, right? The borders between the written word and the audiovisual and the, the novel and cinema and so on. Uh, then the second book that you mentioned was uh, Ventana sobre el Atlántico, which is an interdisciplinary study on the cultural, artistic, as well as political and interactions between the United States and Spain throughout the 20th and the 21st centuries. So it's clear that it's a very inter, in, uh, I mean, a, a study in which the concept of border at many levels is relevant, not just because it's a study of the relations between the United States and Spain, but also because uh, it is a very interdisciplinary volume that includes not just conventional scholarly articles and, and uh, or chapters, but also testimonies. It includes a series of testimonies from writers, from artists, from um, educators and, and uh, other people whose life and whose work has been very much impacted by the experience of being Spaniards in the United States or vice versa. Um, then there's a another uh, book, an, an edition of, of articles that I that I did. I don't know if you mentioned it, but it's very relevant to this concept of borders. In fact, the very title, oh yeah, you, you mentioned it before. Tracing the borders of the Tracing Spanish the borders. horror cinema on television. Yes. That's amazing. It's a great and yeah, so the, the very word borders is in the title and um, the horror genre has been, of course, vilified and, and uh, you know, uh, looked uh, down on for, for many decades, but it's a very interesting genre in the sense that it's, if, if we look at borders, if we look at limits and explorations of limits and horror alongside with porn probably is, is are the two genres that have always been exploring the limits, right? The limits of what's tolerable, what's um, expressible, what's admissible, what's acceptable. Um, and uh, also exploring the limits of political um, censorship and, and, and 
religious censorship and, and so on. So in that sense, uh, just writing and working on, with horror uh, means that you are working in, in along very dark and areas of, of film studies and, and cultural studies. And, and also the fact that horror as a genre is very much, uh, I mean, among, well, all cinema is very globalized and very international today as an, as an industry and, and as a spectator practice, but horror in particular, Spanish horror more in particular, is very much an international um, uh, business and, and industry. So in that sense, um, we, I mean, I don't know, I'm just think of, uh, well, we, we could name many directors. Guillermo del Toro comes to mind. This is a Mexican, but he himself is someone who has worked very much along borders uh, in many senses, and and uh, Nacho Vigalondo among the Spanish, and and many many others. So, uh, and then yeah, the the uh, volume that you just mentioned um, of the journal Humanities, which relates to. Actually, what what I'm, I'm more interested in uh, in in nowadays in recent years, which is the um, social environmental approach to culture and uh, to cinema as well. And in this particular volume, we try to explore. And uh, by the way, you have a, an extraordinary um, article in 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 that volume, Miguel, one of my favorites. And um, we explore. I guess the more general, there are many questions that generate this volume, but maybe the, the more general one is, uh, what is the, the role of cinema? What is the function? What is the place of cinema in the moment of social and environmental emergency that we're living? And also as we think about the future or possible futures, uh, what role has cinema or, or can cinema play in terms of providing imaginaries or provide inspiration, or also in which ways is cinema even possible or will even be possible in the, in the future as we know it today, because film industry worldwide is a completely unsustainable industry. Um, in recent years, I've been working uh, on the materiality of, of cinema and the material costs and environmental costs of the film industry and film production and film film consumption, especially nowadays that we watch most films via stream video and um, the energy involved in that and the environmental impact of that is enormous. So that also has to do with, with the concept of future when we discuss the future of cinema, right? We have to think in material terms, is cinema an environmental, I mean, a, a sustainable, a viable, practice for the future? And if so, uh, what type of cinema? We have to think about what kind of cinema will be possible, what kind of cinema will be desirable um, in the context of, of a future, an immediate future that's going to be very different from what we have known until now in terms of energy supply, in terms of availability of, of materials and, and, and so on. Um, yeah, that's, that's an amazing topic. Actually, uh, we had explored that topic in another film festival that I I, I worked with is uh, the Watertown's Environmental Film Festival, and Erin Spiley, who is another graduate from this area from North Carolina, who is a biologist and filmmaker, uh, she has a really interesting proposal, almost in a, in in the form of a of a manifesto or anti-manifesto uh, that we cannot produce more film, that we cannot produce more images, uh, that we can try, we have to use the archive. And the archive is, is, is the body, right? The memories and the body archives that we, we bring. And uh, talking about border subjects that don't have you know, a say on the archive because they have been not uh, uh, allowed to be part of the archive, then they need to be registered in the archive. Then there is exceptions, but that we have to produce cinema with the archive. That stories have been can be told several times to avoid that carbon footprint and that uh, incredible uh, 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 
impact uh, that this industry as it is uh, it takes on on the planet uh, we have to keep exploring that so amazing Let, let's go to to Roderico y'all and then we because we're going to start you see there are several tries that we want to try to put together and I love that Lauren has your little one what is his name hello hey boy great to see you here his name is Bear Osito. Hey, Bear. <laughs> Bear Osito, como estas? Oh, great to have him here. Yes, it's the best audience that we that we need, you know, in the conversation. Uh, let me then introduce uh, Rodrigo Yol Diaz. Hola, Rodrigo, como estas? Uh, Rodrigo uh, is a filmmaker, he's a photographer uh, from uh, 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 Guatemala. He's uh, a Maya Cachiquel himself. Uh, uh, and here we are uh, uh, facing that uh, also bordering space uh, uh, that is a, a very interesting one. Uh, Rodrigo for more than 15 years had been working as an independent photo journalist documenting the struggles of survivors uh, to overcome the aftermath of war and genocide in Guatemala uh, and the communities uh, affected by ongoing extractive development projects and their relationship with migration to the United States. That's uh, the connection with uh, Jordi's work uh, very strongly there. Uh, Roderico was born in a coffee plantation, uh, a coffee plantation that was owned by uh, Dutch people, uh, a relic of uh, colonialism in Guatemala, where indigenous people were forced uh, to work uh, in European owned plantations. And remember, coffee is, uh, we're talking about making waves. Um, uh, coffee is a global commodity uh, that functions in a global space of trade and, and uh, um, a, a very interesting connection there too. Uh, after being for this place uh, with his family, Rodrigo worked in a variety of agricultural jobs uh, throughout his childhood and early adulthood. Uh, adulthood to pay his way through school. Uh, he was the first one uh, to attend a college, uh, a first generation um, graduate from his family. Uh, he studied anthropology and uh, in order to support also his work, he, he joined several forensic teams uh, 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 through the process of uh, reconciliation, through and reconciliation in Guatemala, through several ex exhumations of mass graves to recover the remains of victims murdered during the internal armed conflict. Then again, here we have the issue of memories, uh, the land, everything returns. Um, Roderick understood that uh, there's an urgency, it was an urgency to document the intensity of what uh, he has seen. Uh, then he turned into photography uh, uh, to, to, to create that archive, to help create that archive. Uh, recently, uh, Roderick moved to North Carolina, expanding his work uh, uh, to try to document uh, the migrant communities in the United States. Uh, his work has been exhibited in several galleries uh, in Guatemala and universities in the United States. Uh, Rodrigo is also the co-founder of uh, an audiovisual production agency, Ichincha Media, uh, and is also a member of the Diversity Photo and Indigenous Photograph uh, Council. Uh, thank you, Rodrigo, for being here. Rodrigo is going to speak in Spanish. Uh, remember, we have interpretation. Uh, thanks to Emily of Chinche Media, too. Um, gracias por estar aquí. Cuéntanos un poco de ese trabajo fronterizo en el que estás, fronterizo dentro de tu propia nación, eh, como comunidades indígenas. A veces ni siquiera hay pertenencia a la idea de nación. Eh, hay naciones dentro de naciones, um, sujetos de frontera, eh, dentro de sus propios espacios nacionales. Uh, racializados, etc. Y luego en este movimiento que has tenido hacia el norte y tu trabajo muy importante con uh, comunidades uh, migrantes aquí en, en las Carolinas y bueno, más allá de Virginia y otros lugares. Bienvenido, buenas tardes. No te escuchamos. Ya, yeah. perfecto. Okay. Bueno, um, bueno, muchísimas gracias Miguel por por la invitación, por el espacio y estoy muy uh, pues feliz de estar acá y compartir también con, con las personas que están participando. Eh, pues sí, como dijiste, pues yo soy indígena de Chiquel de Guatemala y 
Y pues tengo un poquito más de cuatro años de haber mudado para acá a Norte Carolina. Así que todavía sigo navegando en el tema del idioma. <risa> Pero pues cada vez va mejor. Um, bueno, eh, pues sí, obviamente el tema de las fronteras son pues muy diversas, muy profundas y se puede entender de como cada uno de nosotros somos como personas, ¿verdad? Cada uno puede entender ese concepto de fronteras desde su experiencia, su historia, su memoria, como, me, como bien menciona, ¿verdad? Entonces, y eso es prácticamente un poco lo que yo intento hacer también en mi trabajo, es eh, como desde de lo visual puedo, eh, o también lo visual puedo uh, entender un poquito, primero entender mi propia historia, ¿no? entender mis propios uh, contextos, mi propia, uh, eh, mi propia memoria histórica y a partir de ahí también cómo eso lo puedo aportar a, a contar con lo que me, con donde yo estoy compartiendo el espacio. ¿no? Entonces eh, creo que eso es lo que a mí me, me hace mucho, como me da mucha, le pongo mucha importancia, perdón, a, a, a mi trabajo. Eh, pues empecé haciendo esto justo después de que se firmaron los acuerdos de paz en Guatemala. Entonces, eh, pues, pues como también como un sobreviviente del, del genocidio en Guatemala y después del desplazamiento uh, forzado, pues desde niño pues prácticamente viví esa situación de, de ponerte fronteras todo el tiempo, ¿no? Empezando por um, tu identidad, tu idioma, ¿no? Entonces, eh, y luego, claro, es el tema de la migración también puede ocurrir, no solo que sales de tu propio territorio eh, como nacional, digamos, sino de tu territorio muy, muy local, ¿verdad? Y eso es la parte donde desde empecé desde muy temprana edad, cuando apenas tenía como siete años, pues el desplazamiento pues tocó hacerlo y, eh, y claro, entonces también entiendes ahí que tienes que volver a repensar cómo sigues adelante cómo re, eh, te, re, uh, te renaces en, en, en ese nuevo contexto en el que vas a estar desenvolviéndote. Eh, y claro, ahí es, donde, eh, ahí es donde ocurren todas las historias, obviamente, ¿verdad? Y, y, y pues también desde niño pues entendí que siempre estaba de lado donde éramos como los objetos de estudios o sujetos de estudios o de observación. Y de alguna manera cuando yo trabajaba ya, como dije, más, un, pues muchos años después, ya joven, eh, en el norte de Guatemala, en comunidades indígenas, con el tema cuando um, recién entraba ese proceso como democrático en Guatemala, pues obviamente había también mucho interés de documentar lo que estaba pasando en Guatemala. Pero estaba documentando también ciertas áreas y había temas en las que Incluso los mismos medios no estaban interesados en, en, en mostrar qué estaba pasando. Uno de esos era, por ejemplo, una cantidad de desalojos violentos que seguían pasando eh, cuando muchas de las familias que habían sido desplazadas estaban intentando regresar a sus comunidades después de la guerra. Eh, y eso era parte de un trabajo que estaba haciendo, digamos, uh, sobre acompañar ese tipo de procesos. Y ahí fui entendiendo también que había necesidad de contar toda esa otra parte que estaba pasando, ¿verdad? contar desde cómo lo veíamos nosotros, eh, esa parte de la historia también. Yo creo que eso es um, también importante para mí, porque hacer este trabajo no solo implica el... Pues yo no pretendo darle la voz a nadie, simplemente pretendo también hacer mi propio proceso de sanación, porque para eso uso mi trabajo. Mucho de cómo empecé a hacer la fotografía, precisamente encontrar una manera de de autosanar mis propios traumas ¿no? de, de la guerra. Eh, entonces, de alguna forma, el estar detrás de la cámara me ayuda un poco a, a enfrentar ese, esos, esos traumas, a enfrentar esa, esos fantasmas, digamos, que, que están ahí presentes. Entonces, y me di cuenta que era algo que, que me empezó a apasionar mucho y pues obviamente me pasé un buen rato de poder encontrar las herramientas eh, como un año para poder tener acceso a, a una primera cámara propia, eh, un año de trabajo. Entonces, um, pero así empecé a hacer mi trabajo. Luego, pues, 
me di cuenta que ahí estaban todas las historias que había, neces había necesidad de, de, de mostrarlas, ¿verdad? Eh, entonces, eh, así fui haciendo mi trabajo por mucho tiempo y me fui enfocando cada vez más a, al tema de un poco de derechos humanos, pero principalmente comunidades sobre indígenas sobrevivientes del, del genocidio y después justo esa transición de cómo el proceso de pacificación era también un proceso de, de toda la apertura a, a los tratados de libre comercio y al, al mercado de tierras en Guatemala, ¿verdad? Y cuando uno antepone un mapa de las masacres en Guatemala sobre un mapa donde ahora se hacen todos los proyectos extractivos, uno entiende perfectamente bien todo el plan que había, ¿verdad? Detrás de eso. Y eso es como, no solo puedes entender, pues obviamente la intención de la violencia, sino también puedes entender cómo todas esas, um, todas esas violencias también generó otro, otro, una cantidad enorme de conflictos sociales, ¿verdad? Todavía puedo, um, sí, pensar cómo mucha gener esta generación de la que yo pertenezco de mi edad en Guatemala, pues éramos prácticamente una generación que eh, no, no puedo decir que no teníamos identidad, sino simplemente éramos, habíamos quedado con un vacío entre la generación más anterior y la otra generación que había sido prácticamente exterminada. ¿verdad? Mucha, eh, entonces, nosotros veníamos como de un de un proceso en donde no habíamos recibido como un legado de toda esa parte de la, del arte, la cultura, toda esa parte de, eh, de elementos culturales que también necesitas como reforzar para entender mejor tu contexto, de alguna manera había quedado como un vacío. ¿no? Y, y pues obviamente habían artistas que sobrevivieron, pero muchos de ellos tuvieron que irse al exilio para, para hacerlo, ¿verdad? para poder mantenerse, y ahí hay mucha, eh, varias gente en Guatemala que están ahí todavía luchando con eso y pues son personas mayores ahora pero que son como personas a los que le tengo mucho respeto porque también se dieron cuenta que era necesidad de aplicar, eh, utilizar su arte como una manera de denuncia también a lo que estaba pasando, pues no solo en Guatemala sino en, en el continente ¿verdad? entonces um, sí, de eso entonces mucho mi trabajo está enfocado en esas líneas entre eh, entender un poquito ¿Cuál ha sido ese caminar de las comunidades indígenas de durante y después de la guerra en Guatemala? Eh, y por supuesto eso tiene como muchos matices, ¿verdad? O muchas fronteras, como, como se dice. Y, y uno de ellas, pues obviamente es la parte de la migración externa, ¿verdad? No solo la gente que había salido eh, a refugiarse eh, por miles a, pues, a Estados Unidos, a Canadá, a otros lugares, este, pero también como ese impacto después de la pacificación también generó otra ola enorme de, de migraciones, ¿verdad? O de desplazamientos forzados de alguna manera para mí, es, era la continuidad de eso. Y eso era lo que a mí me, inter, a mí me ha interesado siempre ir buscando la, la conexión, ¿verdad? Entonces, obviamente eso, esos procesos llevó después, un, hace años más recientes, a casos como el tema de justicia transicional, en donde he seguido varios casos importantes, como el mismo caso de genocidio contra el ex dictador Efraín Ríos Montt, ¿verdad? y otros casos más que han sido emblemáticos en Guatemala. Eh, entonces hice también, eh, era de las pocas personas con raíces indígenas que estábamos ahí en esa sala documentando eh, ese juicio, y pues habían pues ahí cientos de periodistas y fotógrafos y camarógrafos, pero uh, una buena parte era eso, era volver a poner la lente en el, en el uh, digamos en este caso en, en Ríos Mond y todo ese es su papel, pero muy poca y seguía exotizándose toda la otra parte que eran las, las personas y las comunidades sobrevivientes, ¿verdad? Y yo pues me fui un poquito más al otro lado y empecé como estaba paralelamente haciendo trabajo con las comunidades que ya venía haciendo, entonces fui también tratando de hacer un archivo de todo eso, ¿verdad? Y eso es una buena parte de, de mi trabajo, es crear esos archivos históricos, ¿verdad? Entonces hice un trabajo de estar todos los días documentando en fotografía, en audio y en video todo el juicio, pero al mismo tiempo estaba visitando comunidades para entender cómo estaban también... Uh, llevando ese proceso, porque estaban incluso tra recibiendo transmisiones en vivo sobre eh, el juicio, 
Y también ver como todo eso, esa otra parte de, de, de cómo estaba pasando la historia al mismo tiempo, ¿verdad? En la sala de juicio, obviamente, era un, una parte nada más de la historia, pero eran como muchas más, ¿no? Entonces, era, era un poquito lo que intenté hacer ahí también. Y así que, pues, eso es parte de mi... Y, bueno, lo que hice con ese archivo, pues, obviamente, yo le di un... Doné una copia completa a, los, a las comunidades sobrevivientes de este archivo, porque, pues, para mí, en realidad, lo importante de mi trabajo es que esa historia, pues obviamente no me pertenece, es la historia de las personas, las comunidades, y una parte importante para mí es cómo eso se lo puedo regresar también. ¿verdad? Y eso es lo que sí intento hacer muchas veces en mi trabajo, es cómo devuelvo eh, la confianza, cómo devuelvo eh, a estas personas que tuvieron la voluntad de abrirme su, sus puertas, su casa, su vida, ¿verdad? su historia, su memoria, y lograr de alguna manera volver a, a decirle, bueno, mira, esta, en realidad esta es tu historia y por lo tanto eso debería ser tuyo, deberías tenerlo ahí, ¿no? Uh, eso es lo que eh, busco también y eso era parte del proyecto de, que empezamos con, con Emily sobre Shinche Media, es intentar contar también esas historias más comunes, ¿no? Historias cotidianas que, que, que hay aquí, en, como tú ves a tu costado muy cerca y ahí, te, ahí están las historias, pues solamente es tomar el tiempo y tomar, tener la disponibilidad uh, para hacerlo. Obviamente eso tiene, hay muchas cosas más detrás, como los recursos, como, ¿verdad? Pero esas son otras cuestiones, pero en términos como muy de, del trabajo de, de documentar, eso es lo, ahí están las historias, ¿verdad? Pero también entender que esa historia debe ser como de vuelta también a las comunidades. Y eso es, creo que es muy importante que no podamos perder de vista como pues personas que estamos ahí, ahí cotidianamente eh, con acceso a ese tipo de, 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 de información, digamos, tenemos que encontrar maneras más sanas, más uh, humanas de, de hacer que esa historia no quede exotizada, no, no sea simplemente para ir a encerrarlo en un teatro, ¿no? sino que vaya de vuelta ahí a la comunidad, que, que, que ayude a, a dignificar y a reivindicar un poco más esas historias de, de las personas, ¿verdad? Eso es un poco mi, mi visión, digamos, obviamente es mi ah, opinión personal de, de esto, eh, eh, pues eso es lo que he intentado hacer y eso estoy también tratando de hacer acá con mi trabajo fotográfico, pues obviamente, eh, como dijo Miguel, pues soy parte de, estas, uh, de estos espacios como Diversified Photo, uh, Indigenous Photo, Proyecto 400 Años también, um, de parte de esta, un, una revista latinoamericana, revista Late, ¿verdad? que es enfocado mucho en trabajo de periodismo de, de largo aliento, que eso es en realidad lo que a mí también me, me gusta. Por eso me interesa mucho el, el, la fotografía documental, porque en el fotoperiodismo obviamente puedes hacer un ir y documentar un, 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 un hecho, ¿no? Y pues va, puedes hacer un buen trabajo y, y puedes mostrar lo que pasó en el momento, pero a veces necesitas tomarte el tiempo, respirar, necesitas sentir lo que estás observando, sentir lo que estás viviendo ahí, lo que las personas te quieren compartir. Y a partir de ahí es que puedes contar con mucho más respeto esa historia. Entonces, eso es lo que le encuentro mucho más, eh, mi vínculo, digamos, como la frontera que cruza un poco más entre la fotografía documental y, el, y pues la audiovisual. Intento como más o menos por ahí navegarlo. Eh, porque... Sí, hay necesidad de, de que a veces tomarse el tiempo para entender cómo hacerlo, eh, cómo esas historias pueden llegar de la mejor manera a, a quienes lo van a, lo van a ver, ¿no? a quienes lo van a, a querer eh, conocer o aprender. Eh, bueno, no. esas son como algunas de las palabras. Gracias. A, a ti mil gracias, Rodrigo. Bueno, creo que vamos a empezar making connections here and i think we are we're arriving to the point of hybrid modes of of communication uh and and this is is is, is really important because we try to put uh, in historical context a little bit uh, uh, always when we talk about uh, this other film or this other way of presenting uh, narratives uh, coming from the south uh, Uh, from a spaces of, of marginality or precarity that the, the need to 
think differently and produce in a, in, with a differential. And then the hybrid mode up, appears, right? That is, there is not only one way to do things, right? Uh, Jordi Marie is an, an undisciplined scholar because he brings testimonies and, and, and chronicles and, and other voices in the work he does. He, he works in collaboration. He's breaking the ground of academic scholarship in which authorship is important. And you build yourself, your name as, a, you know, as an intellectual. But no, you're breaking down that, that uh, space. You, you, you explore this is a bordering narratives that no one will really want to go, go there because then we'll be, you know, a stain as, 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 as an intellectual working with horror or, with, you know, these bordering genders that, that actually are connected to, to uh, uh, existential modes, right, of uh, 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 border and, and extreme ways of, of feeling, you know. Uh, or, or Victoria and Lauren working on hy hybrid modes of communication, in which journalism is not top down, but is is community built and comes from the community and has to return to it uh, uh, through multiple venues. Right? It's it's not anymore the, uh, a publication, a weekly or or a daily, but there is you know this amount of other ways to to address in the multimedia. Uh, a way uh, uh, the stories that are minor stories that start uh, creating an entire new way to understand uh, the experience of of migrants uh, through their work, uh, fundamental work for us that consume at the end uh, this migrant other, this exotic other, as Roderick was saying, through uh, culinary means, for example, through flavors, through smells, through through to taste, to 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 textures, uh, to colors, right? Uh, that somehow brings us, you know, human dimensions on 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 this mostly industrial way of, of being in the world today, right? Then I, I want to ask you about those decisions to 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 use these hybrid modes uh, of practice in in each in each of you, and we can start uh, again with Victoria, Lauren, Jordi. And Rodrigo, and then I'll bring uh, uh, Rodrigo Dorfman because he he is a hybrid producer, uh, he's a multimedia producer. Then Paul well, will him give him the voice. And uh, uh, for all of you that are uh, joining us, uh, be ready. In, in fifteen minutes, we'll open uh, the door for questions, comments, and conversations. Could you make? Maybe tell repeat the question a little more. It's, it's about the hybrid the hybrid modes of 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 creation. I mean, you have decided not to do just uh, food journalism, let's say, mm -hmm. or to do just filmmaking, or do just uh, write uh, 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 use a commercial avenue to 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 tell stories. And you 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 had a different take on the way you do things. And why is that? Where where does it come from? Where is it going? Yeah, I mean, I think there's always something um, more complex behind food, of course, but every every single issue has um, other things, you know, driving the challenges. Um, a lot of it is whether it's like a systemic op oppression or, you know, an emotional challenge or block. Um, and I think, you know, for me, hybrid modes also explore like different different avenues of like a sensory observation of the experience. So um, because, you know, I can write the hell out of something, but it's not going to be the same as if I can show it visually. And then maybe that that's when you can <laughs> smell something through the screen. You know, you feel it in a different way. Um, I've worked on some audio only pieces too, which are really beautiful because the focus that your your ears need to attune to sounds, um, you know, can like bring back another sort of memory for you. Um, visually, you know, I think the film that followed ours on Tuesday night, um, Guardian of Memory, uh, very much had like um, material objects among the scenes 
to create a sense of something. And it wasn't exactly what they were talking about, but you could sort of like surmise based on what you were watching. Um, and so I think that's like a fun way to explore things. It's not, it's a, it deviates a bit from like the true journalistic form, but it's still very much observatory. And, you know, El Cotidiano um, is something that's really important because that's what's in someone's memory often. Um, it may not be like an ex extraordinary or sensational event, but it may just be like a daily a, a daily occurrence that happened in someone's life that has almost become a ritual. And so like, if you can show that in film, you can't necessarily always write that. Um, so I think for me, it's all about like the feelings that, uh, that come out based on different modes of, um, you know, expressing that sort of documented view. I think to echo off of Victoria, um, whenever a, a visual project or any project story of any sort is brought to, to my table, I always sit and think, what is the best medium in which this story needs to be told? You know, is it documentary filmmaking? Is it, you know, documentary photography? Is it an editorial look? Could it even be a commercial look that might reach a broader audience? Um, and then on that is what is the best genre in which to tell this story? So whether I'm trying to go a more journalistic angle or whether I'm trying to go a more artistic angle, I kind of have to think, you know, what is the end goal and what is the narrative in the story that I want, uh, you know, the audience to take away and the feeling that they need to take away from this work. Um, so this the second part of that is the people who are involved in the work what is the best avenue in which to tell the story which is oftentimes a hybrid version um something that is slightly more conceptual with something that is slightly more documentary to as accurately tell the stories in ways that honor those stories and honor the people whose stories were we're hoping to share um so yeah, that that would be probably my best way of making you know hybrid modes of communication. Thank you so much. That was uh, incredible, uh, Jordi. Yeah, I'm listening with a lot of attention and interest, and um, I'm learning a lot. In in my particular case, um, being primarily a scholar and an educator, I suppose. Uh, my main concern and preoccupation and something that I've been trying to do for, for a number of years now is to try to make my work uh, reach beyond the, the, the limits, the very, very limited limits of the academia. Uh, very often we write for just for our ourselves and our peers and, and and we write for cuatro gatos right and in, in, say in Spanish and, and nobody reads us and and we think that we are changing the world with our very complex ideas and and those ideas never reach anybody or anywhere um and and so I, I've been trying to to um, go beyond those those limits and to me it's very important that the research and the and um the scholarly work reaches the outside world and that there's a connection and that it has an impact and that means that number one what topics you write about what do you say about them and also where do you publish and where do you which channels you use to give voice to to that and and who are your not just your readers but your who, who do you speak with and and uh who who do you connect with so for me it's very important um i mean for a number of years i've been writing and and, and speaking and, and uh interacting mm, i still publish in scholarly venues because i'm supposed to do that and, and there's value some value to that i think limited value but there is some value to to that um uh, but also I've been publishing in, in, in other types of publications. Uh, so for me, the connection between 
academia and journalism is very important as it is the connection between academia and activism. And I think good, meaningful pedagogical work is activism by definition and good scholarship is pedagogical also. And because of that is also part of an activist uh, project, so to speak. And I would also insert into that uh, art. I think artists have a lot to do and to say in, in this conversation in terms of constructing imaginaries and inspiring and motivating and, and helping us find ways. And, and in that sense, uh, art and activism, what we call artivism, right, is, is a very important also um, force. And for me, it's always been very important, not always, but for, for a good number of years already, very important to, to try to work along those. We're also talking about borders here, right? The border between the academic world and the uh, and uh, the world of the, uh, the outside world, otherwise known as the real world, right? Um, I, I've also been very critical in my recent publications with Hispanists and Hispanic scholars, not Hispanic, but uh, scholars that work in the area of Hispanic studies, because um, many of them seem to work in a bubble and from a bubble in a, in a Torre de Marfil, right, in, in an ivory tower. And, and uh, that's actually the title of one of my publications. And trying to, and it's important to shake and to uh, get people to, to, to wake up because we are in a very, very, very uh, critical situation. And, you know, we've been looking at our navels for, for long enough now, and I think we've seen everything that there's to see in our navels, and now we have to look elsewhere and, and we have to uh, try to find meaning in what we do. Uh, so that is, that's what I would have to say about this. Thank you so much, Jordi, uh, because, I mean, this space is this film festival is emanated from a space of, of privilege in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in public and private universities in ivory towers. Uh, we need to remind ourselves of what, why do we do what we do and uh, what are the points of origination and where is all these things going and, and if it really matters in, in, in the context of of, of, of real experiences taking place in the world today. And thank you, that's a, 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 the best way to do it and, and to say it, I, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And Roderico, also, I wanted to, me gustaría preguntarte, por ejemplo, en esta hibridización, uh, el cuerpo uh, es importante, ¿cierto? La, la memoria del cuerpo, en tu trabajo documental inicial uh, en, en los procesos de exhumación, uh, todo el cuerpo que decae, que se decae, que se pierde, que se vuelve polvo. Uh, o sea, hay ahí como una, una situación muy liminal. Eh, pero luego también tienes un interés muy particular por, por la música, ¿no? Por, y mucho del trabajo que estás haciendo aquí con comunidades tiene que ver con esa dimensión musical. Uh, porque las memorias también están incorporadas en memorias corporales, el ritmo. De hecho, si pensamos en, 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 en el audio, lo que nos estaba diciendo Victoria, el mundo del audio tiene una, un poder eh, eh, emotivo y emotivo muy, muy, muy poderoso, eh, porque esto se trae... Eh, no solamente digamos, en las músicas tradicionales, en las músicas folclóricas, pero no hay una notación, las historias, las, las, las canciones no se escriben en un pentagrama, eh, esto se lleva en el cuerpo y se lleva por generaciones, es, es lo más cercano que tendríamos a, a, al instinto animal que no necesita aprender eh, porque está aprendido, ¿cierto? Y que también tiene una dimensión muy política, ¿no? Eh, el hecho de los acentos, ¿no? una política de acentos, que son las tonalidades, los ritmos de cómo nos comunicamos, los que no pertenecemos a sociedades eh, homogéneas, el hecho de ser indígena, de hablar una lengua indígena en un país donde la lengua oficial eh, eh, es el español y llegas a un lugar donde la lengua oficial es el inglés, o sea, los múltiples niveles de, de sonoridades allí. Eh, eh, me interesa de pronto que, que nos cuentes un poco sobre tu interés a ese nivel. 
Sí, gracias. Y el género del videoclip, que me parece. Okay. <risa> okay. Sí, justo, justo un, unos meses, como un, unos meses antes de, un par de meses antes de mudarme por acá, estaba terminando un material en Guatemala. Y pues que participó en un par de festivales, en el Maya, en el Festival este Internacional de, eh, de Medios y pues, Voces Indígenas. Eh, y también en, en un festival en, en México sobre cine centroamericano. Y era un poquito sobre, vinculado a la música, como un músico, un joven regresa a una comunidad que había abandonado cuando tenía cinco años y que pues él solo recordaba lo que su familia le había ido manteniendo, digamos, en la memoria. Uh, lo que él tenía recuerdo era que su papá había muerto en un accidente de auto en, regresando del pueblo hacia una comunidad, ¿verdad? Digamos, pero... Y él entendía que la región donde estaba pasando, eh, estaban pasando conflictos sociales. Y justo yo en ese tiempo estaba documentando uh, el encarcelamiento que ha habido sobre eh, líderes indígenas que, que estaban como, eh, pues digamos que oponiéndose a, a proyectos extractivistas como hidroeléctricas, minería y eso. Y justo estaba como haciendo seguimiento de hacía varios años de, de esos temas. Y, y era justo el pueblo de donde este, este persona, digamos, el personaje de, de la historia, eh, quería volver. Y entonces, pues, hicimos todo el proceso para pues, que pudiera volver. Y él, pues, ya como músico iba a hacer un concierto. Eh, dijo, bueno, voy a tratar de hacer un concierto en beneficio para las familias que, de, de las personas encarceladas. Y esa es más o menos la, la línea, digamos, de la historia. Pero el asunto es que hay un momento en, en el que él se encuentra con uno de los mejores amigos de su papá, ¿verdad? o el hermano, perdón, el hermano de uno de los mejores amigos de su papá, y este mejor amigo de su papá era uno de los presos eh, de estos líderes indígenas, ¿verdad? Entonces él no había dimensionado, digamos, esa parte de, de lo que toda la conexión muy íntima que él tenía, ¿verdad?, en su propia historia. Entonces para mí, contarlo desde la, desde la línea de la música fue un, una manera también bastante eh, bonita, digamos, porque tiene, más, tiene también muchas emociones y tiene otro lenguaje, como, como dices, Miguel, tiene, tiene otros lenguajes en el cual también se pueden transmitir esas emociones, se pueden transmitir esa historia. Y eso es un poquito lo que me interesa también con este nuevo proyecto en el que voy caminando, no sé, todavía está como muy, tiene muchos matices por donde voy transitándolo. Uh, y pues obviamente uno, una parte principal es esa exhibición que, que hicimos junto con Miguel, Rafael, y Sofía y y Emily, y pues, uh, y pues la idea del tema también de raíces, rutas y ritmos es, es un poquito esa idea, ¿no? Es como uh, obviamente traemos toda esa raíz de miles de años de, de sonido, de ritmos, de, uh, de elementos que nos hacen ser, ¿verdad? Que nos hacen ser como, como personas, como comunidades, como pueblos, y a veces no necesariamente la palabra, eh, ¿verdad? Es la que, es la forma de transmitirla, a veces son los mismos sonidos, ¿verdad? Entonces, más o menos la idea por ahí iba, iba con eso, como las personas que, digamos, um, transitamos de un lugar, de un territorio a otro, pues obviamente llevamos con nosotros eh, todo ese bagaje histórico, de memoria, de, de qué sé yo, de conocimientos, y de alguna forma uno lleva esa semilla y la va a sembrar a donde llegas, ¿no? Y obviamente eso pues, se, se nace y se multiplica y, y se comparte, ¿verdad?, entonces, eso es la idea de, de este proyecto también, es como eh, toda esa cantidad de, eh, de sonido, de historias, de memorias, llegan a un espacio y ese espacio se, pues, hace una explosión de todo eso, ¿no? Y, pero, ¿cómo logras encontrarlo de vuelta? ¿Cómo logras tejerlo otra vez para que no se disperse, para que no quede como, um, no sé, para no, para no escuchar simplemente muchos ruidos al mismo tiempo, sino entender lo que es toda una sinfonía, digamos, ¿verdad? Y es, es esa es la intención también. Um, y así eso es parte de, de este proyecto, que igual estamos documentando otro proyecto en Tennessee, que es justamente ese puente entre la comunidad apalache, en las comunidades apalaches eh, de las montañas, y la comunidad eh, inmigrante latinoamericana, que está llegando por esos territorios, y cómo todos esos uh, sonidos, uh, ritmos, sabores, todo eso está ayudando a tejer un poquito o acercar un poquito ese, eh, esas distancias que hay 
entre el entendimiento diverso de, pues, de los mundos en, en lo que ahora compartimos acá, ¿verdad? Eh, incluso una de las personas con la que conversaba, una, una, una joven, decía como, bueno, yo nunca había pensado cómo eh, estar en este proceso sobre conectando la, 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 las dos comunidades, me hizo también entender que, que nunca había pensado que había necesidad de, de entender mi propia comunidad como apalache. ¿no? Entonces, de alguna manera también va ayudando a, 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 a abrir otros puentes. Y pues obviamente eh, en el tema de, 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 lo, um, de los videos, de los videoclips, pues es una manera también a veces un poco, uh, digamos, corta y, y un poquito conceptual de poder contar también una historia o ayudar también a, a mover algún tema. Eh, eso hicimos, bueno, hemos trabajado con, bueno, con varias gente, pero principalmente con este amigo Joe Troop, que pues obviamente es, es nacido aquí en Winston-Salem, pero eh, ha vivido por muchos lados y uno de esos pues es Argentina por una década y pues él también le gusta hacer esa fusión de los ritmos y los sonidos latinoamericanos o en nuestro caso también lo hacía con un pues, japonés porque vivía ahí con, la, con el ritmo apalache ¿no? Como, como todo eso al final también genera esas riquezas pero también se pueden usar para eh, tocar temas que son temas sociales temas políticos y eso hicimos un poco la, hace un un poco más de un año con un videoclip sobre, sobre la frontera, ¿verdad? Sobre una, una historia que yo escribí de una canción sobre un adolescente pues, anónimo de Honduras que pues, quedó ahí en, en, en la mitad del desierto y pues él, su canción va sobre eso, sobre esos jóvenes migrantes que quedan ahí muertos en el desierto pero que su madre está preguntándose en Honduras dónde está, ¿verdad? ¿qué pasó con él? Entonces era un poquito tocar tema, el tema de la migración, pero también tocar como pues de una manera más, digamos, um, sutil, puedo decir la palabra, no sé si es la correcta, pero eh, para que otras personas quieran oír también sobre esos temas. Porque a veces le puede llegar con un tema como muy directo a las personas y te lo van a rechazar. Bueno, vas a hablar del tema de la frontera, por ejemplo, y hay mucha gente acá que... Obviamente hay una resistencia hacia eso, ¿no? pero si le cuentas de una manera, uh, en este caso con una canción, a veces las personas pueden recibirlo un poquito más amable, incluso no, no darse cuenta que, que están reflexionando sobre el tema. Y eso es justo lo otro que hicimos ahora recientemente y también eso, gracias a Miguel por el espacio ahí de presentarlo en el, en el festival. Esta otra, este otro videoclip sobre Leonard Peltier, ¿verdad? este líder indígena encarcelado de hace más de 46 años. Entonces, también esto es parte de una campaña sobre la marcha que está pasando ahora desde que empezó desde Tennessee en septiembre y, hasta, y termina en noviembre eh, en DC. Y la idea es, es cómo también todo este trabajo que hacemos, como es toda esa mixtura, digamos, de, de, de usar lo audiovisual, de usar uh, eh, sí, nuestras, nuestras herramientas, pueden ayudar también a tocar temas y acercar un poquito a... Uh, hacernos un poco sensibles a, a, a entender que hay necesidad de humanizarnos, ¿verdad? Es un poquito la idea. Y, y este caso es como un, pues, una persona que todavía sigue reflejándose eh, en esa larga historia de, las, de, lo, de, de lo que el, nos ha pasado a los pueblos indígenas, como todavía alguien sigue estando ahí encarcelado. No sé, su cuerpo en este caso, ¿no? Pero pero en, en realidad es simbólico que es, es una manera de encarcelar la historia de, de, todo, de todos los pueblos. ¿verdad? Entonces creo que es, es como también puede parecer sencillo un videoclip, pero puedes mandar un mensaje muy poderoso con eso. ¿verdad? Entonces creo que para mí es bien interesante poder explorar diversas eh, herramientas eh, para poder contar historias. Entonces creo que eso es lo que me emociona cuando puedo tener, uh, elegir muchas maneras de, de hacerla, ¿no? que puede ser como bien decía Victoria, un audio puede ser también eh, escribir un, un, una historia, ¿verdad? O puede cotarse de una historia uh, audiovisual o, o en fotografía, qué sé yo, ¿verdad? O el archivo mismo, como hay muchas maneras, ¿verdad? Entonces creo que esa es la riqueza también y cómo las fronteras sí están, pero no al mismo tiempo en este trabajo, ¿no? en este campo, ¿no? Como aparentemente hay una frontera entre el cine y la fotografía o el audio en apariencia, ¿verdad? Pero en realidad todo el tiempo están cruzándose. 
todo el tiempo están, están como entretejiéndose y eso es lo que le da mucha riqueza también. Yo creo que para mí eso es lo que me, me da mucha emoción poder como pensar, imaginarse uno cómo puede contar, eh, como decía Lauren, cómo puede uno contar la mejor manera, encontrar la mejor herramienta de que esa historia llegue a la comunidad, ¿verdad? Y encontrar la manera más, más bonita, digamos. Eso. Muchas gracias. A oh, ti, Rodrigo. Mil, mil, mil gracias. Uh, I want to say also that Jordi is a musician. He's a jazz musician. It's precisely that kind of interaction. is right and, and building very others and multiple rhythms and that that that, that, that functions really well and, and, and what you do guys you you are some some all you are your djs and 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 you do jazz and do you right, uh, choose the rhythm and build all their others that that's a little bit of, of the kind of things that we're trying to address here uh we're getting to 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 the close of the event i want to share what rodrigo dorman has to say because we had a conversation that he wants you guys to hear i would love to have a question from each, each of you to another of you in the chat while we watch rodrigo's uh uh addressing some of the issues of bordering genres, fiction, sci-fi, hybrid modes. Uh, it takes like 12, 13 minutes uh, to hear him. And we'll come back just to say bye. But please share a question to one of your, your uh, fellow participants and you guys there. Uh, please uh, share some questions. We'll love to hear from you too. Then I'm going to ask you to uh, close your, your screens and uh, Uh, while we uh, listen uh, to Rodrigo Dorfman. <laughs> And welcome, welcome, Rodrigo. It's great to have you here. I know that you cannot make it in person live, but we are anyway virtual and, and we work in media. Then mediation is part of what we do. Tell us a little bit about your uh, and where are you coming from, uh, both uh, life and uh, professionally. And uh, then we'll start from there. Yes, it's uh, really a pleasure to be here with you, Miguel. And uh, I was um, actually the reason I can't be live, I think it's because I'm going to be filming. And when you have to choose between filming and reality and appearing and uh, um, uh, filming versus appearing somewhere where I'm not filming, I, I will always take the filming side. My point of origination, la uh, origen, verdad? Where am I from? Where do I come from? So I come from Chile. And uh, when I was a little kid, I was exiled when I was six years old and I left Chile into political exile with my parents. And I went around the world and then I kept coming back to Chile, back and over and over again, having this sort of north-south, north-south. So in the norte, I'm going to the south.
So I did have a place of retreat, uh, which many people don't have. So I did have privilege. I understand that. And so when I went there, I worked with a, a, a group called Teleanalysis, which is this famed underground news agency in Chile. of mediated images, and therefore of stories that I tell of others, um, was in Chile in 1985, when I had come back and I was 18 years old and I graduated high school, and I was in Bethesda, Maryland, and I, did, I applied to Berkeley, California, but maybe I wasn't going to get in, and I took six months, and I went to Chile in the middle of a dictatorship to live, and I really wanted to live for the first time to experience the dictatorship. And also, uh, out of a feeling of guilt of being in exile, one always wants to return and say, well, let's get a little punishment. In order for me to truly feel Chilean, I need to feel what it feels like to live under the dictatorship and to have fear. Uh, with the privilege that I knew that I had a backup plan, I had a green card at that point. So I did have a place of retreat, uh, which many people don't have. So I did have privilege. I understand that. And so when I went there, I worked with a, a, a group called Teleanalysis, which is this famed underground news agency in Chile that was uh, partially funded by external European uh, television crews and markets and uh, embassies in which they filmed with um, foreign press credentials so they could get away uh, with filming certain things. And then they made these videos like 60 minutes, like 20, 20, 20 documentaries about everyday life that was then shipped to the Europe for use in Europe, but that could not be shown on Chilean television, which was under heavy censorship. So Chileans, in a way, could not see their own reality. And so what they did is that they made VHS tapes and they had underground screenings all over Chile distributed uh, and shown in churches, which were still sort of the last places of asylum. And, um, and people would gather together in defiance, in secret kind of, and watch in a tiny little TV with a Betamax. And what was incredible for me, and I was about 18 years old, was to sit, and I had seen what it is, because I was at the time also working as a sound man with one of the most wonderful uh, videographers at the time called Jerko Jankovic, who had been assigned to me. So I carried the sound thing that weighed maybe 50 pounds, attached like an umbilical cord to his camera, and we were running through, you know, the madness that was chilly under dictatorship and under a upheaval at the time. And I would actually sit and look at the people watching the their lives and to watch people see themselves for the first time in a mediated sense in a way that constructs a reality that makes sense to them also that teaches thing teaches them about um teaches them about having the capacity to find spaces where you can express political language when you can have conversations that were not able to happen anywhere else but in those rooms because of the documentaries elicited these conversations with, that were missing in the public sphere, but then th if they had them, they were the blueprints for the possibility of creating a civic society in five years from now when democracy would come. Well, it, that was mind blowing at the time, uh, as you can imagine. It's, it's, it's precisely that uh, ethical dimension or the ethics of this underground work uh, and the aesthetic that that brings into the fore, right? that we see in your work then moving into another space that we can say is also uh, a, a space of oppression. That is all the, the work you have done uh, in, in the South of the United States <laughs> uh, about exile, uh, about uh, being without a root, a rooted communities, uh, in collaboration with many of them, uh, and then we see a little bit, could you just make the bridge now from that powerful experience of a time to come, a time that was, and a time to come, then transport it into the spaces of, of the south of the United States, of what you call the Nuevo South. Okay. So my experience at that moment in Chile, 1985, I took with me, right? And it took me a while up until 1998. So it took me another 15 years to truly start putting them into practice, because I had a long winding road through theater and Hollywood and 
uh, book selling business and, and writing screenplays and plays. And it took me a while to understand it. But now that I think about it, it, it contains all the great, great challenges that we are today, I think, at least in the United States of America, issues of audience. Who are you making these films for? You know, what is the purpose of these films? Um, you know, I saw the statistic in which, uh, in a way, for example, let's take Sundance Film Festival. The only point of Sundance Film Festival, how do they judge their success, is how many films were sold, right? Sold to whom? Sold why? And, and that's fine. It's an, in, it's an industry, right? But to me, the question of who is your audience? Why are you making this film? Which is, at, at, at the heart of it, the most basic question anyone asks to anyone, whether you're going to give them 5000 or $5 million, you know, is essential. And oftentimes, um, and the answer to that question is your positionality. That is, to me, the answer to that question who is your audience and, and not just who, but how are you going to make sure that you're consequential with your answer? Because you can say my answer, my, oh yes, I want to show this to the community that I am actually working with. And then the next step of course is, well, how do you do that? You know, one thing is to say it, the other is, well, where are the means of distribution that are popular means of distribution that existed in the 60s and 70s through uh, cultural centers, through cinetecas, through traveling cinemas, through small little uh, union halls, right? All these community spaces that existed back then that could have worked. Today, they don't exist as much, right? And so it's, and so for me, the challenge of working in the South uh, is that, well, I am a Latin American film director. I'm an Latin American artist living in the South. And so therefore I have to ask myself, well, am I in exile from Latin America or do I then consider the South, the Nuevo South, anywhere from Virginia down uh, to be Latin America? And you know, how as people say, I ask a lot of my immigrant friends, ask them, so where is your home? And they say, well, my home is where my family is. And so maybe somebody asked me, well, where is your home? And then my question would be, the answer would be, well, my home is where my where I can exercise my ethical and moral and political um, craft <laughs> in a way that I feel that I am fulfilled, that I am okay in balance as much as possible. So therefore, Latin Amer I am Latin American, and if I'm in the South, well, then the South becomes Latin American for me. Not only because it is El Sur, the South, but also because it's, it's it's colonial history, as we have you know, often discussed, but also because suddenly the South is now inhabited by millions and millions and millions of immigrants who've arrived, to, most of them directly from the South, maybe bouncing off Los Angeles a little bit, but a lot of them have come without any referential points to um, U.S. history as we know it within the confines of its borders, the Chicano movement or the border narrative. They've come straight from Latin America, and that hasn't happened in a very long time to have all these immigrants who are straight Latin Americans. They haven't become Latinos yet. They haven't been Chicanos. They're not Tex-Mex. They're straight Latin Americans coming to, the, to this part of the South that's already, in a way, as a history of colonialism and have the capacity to start afresh. And so for me, as, as a filmmaker, to experience the birth of these communities, to watch them through the years as a chronicler, both as someone who has chronicled the lives, but also who is part of the life and who also has politically been engaged in the creation of some of the institutions, like the Latino Community Credit Union institution uh, that has actually financed a lot of the films that I've made that have been educational, hybrid documentaries, uh, films that teach people, help people understand how to buy homes, the most boring thing you can think of the world, but also the most essential buying a home, right? And so for me, this work that I've done is always pushing the boundaries of how one is expected to create in a commodified capitalist society, which I am inside, I'm not outside of it. And so my realization is that if you're gonna be a Latin Mer in Latin America, things are difficult. Things are always tough, right? You're always chambiando, you're always trying to make things work, you're always patching things, and, but you're trying to make them beautiful but also you have the possibility of imperfection, right? The cinema imperfection, right? The cinema that, that says, if I'm reflecting a community that has a few means, then I need to make films in a way that has few means. Representation basically is the act of 
um, let's say, documenting, translating, forming, but it is looking at the past. Representation, and, and I know, and I know that figurative is uh, the idea of figuration is also about the past, supposedly. But you know what? I don't care. I'm, maybe I'm creating a new way of of expressing this in the English language so that we can actually act on it and change the way we think about representation. So representation is you look at the past. Why? Because I am representing this community, but that representation is already fixed. It's an identity. I am representing a fixed identity. In other words, the word representation does not include the capacity of transformation, of dynamic creativity in the moment of the, let's say the fluidity of what identity is, right? And so I'm representing the Latino community and that representation is fixed. And we don't ask, well, how was it fixed? Who created that identity? Who's in charge of saying that that is the identity? But then if you start using the word figuration, which has to do with figure, with, with the contours of things that are sort of feel to be in, in, in transition, what you're saying is, the act of representing is actually dynamic and that in the moment you are creating that identity in the moment. And so therefore this is to me, I'm thinking, oh, this is the solution in order to find a new, a, not a new form, but forms of documentary filmmaking and storytelling that allow for the expression of the energy of the creativity, which is at the heart of the Latin American experience, I think too. Crear, crear, poder popular, right? That was like the chant of the, Latin, of, of the Chilean popular unity movement that I remember as a young child and I've always carried, create, create popular power, right? And to me, it was like, you create popular power and it is the power of the, pop, of the people, right? And so the capacity to understand that when you are representing, you are actually creating, co-creating then, then the co-creation comes into being then I think you have a totally different way of approaching the protagonist, the subject, the participants, the, 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 the thing that which you are, you are um, trying to communicate, translate to another audience that may or may not understand it, or even to those who are the protagonists so that they can see themselves not as fixed, but in, in, in transformation. To be continued, my dear friend.